All right, welcome everybody to this quarter's School and Community Garden Collaborative Workshop. We're so excited to share with you some of our partners and what they're doing, hear from other master gardeners in other counties and what they're doing, and to hear from you. So if you are from an organization that li would like to share an upcoming event or activity, at the end we have a section for that. And each quarter, approximately, we do a workshop, and we'd like to have you guys in the future if you don't have anything to share now, but if you have something to share in the future, a work day at a community garden, an event at your community garden or in your community, something that's associated with your school and open to the public, um, you're welcome to share those at future school and community garden collaborative workshops. Oops, sorry. Oh, totally out of control here. Okay. All right. So just a few housekeeping. Uh, this presentation is being recorded. If you're gonna wanna share this presentation, we're also gonna break this presentation into sections. So we'll record it as a whole, and then we'll also break the different uh, workshop or different presentations into sections. You can go to our website, and on the left-hand side, you'll see recent presentations, and you can click on that, and you can find this uh, PDF of this presentation, um, parts of it that we have, and then also the recording that we have. We're gonna take questions at the end of each section. Feel free to drop them in the chat, or if we have time at the end of sections um, and we have an opportunity for you, to, for you to unmute yourself, you're welcome to do that. I have my camera off just to save bandwidth. I'm gonna turn it on real quick. Let's see here, I don't know if you can see me. There I am, oh, I don't know, somewhere I am, um, but I am going to uh, turn my camera off just to save bandwidth and we have the participants. Uh, if you could turn your camera off and keep your mic muted, that would be great. And then again, you can look for recent presentations on the left-hand side of our website. We're gonna drop some links in the chat. If you're on a, a laptop or a desktop, you should be able to click the three dots on the upper right-hand side of your chat section. And that will allow you to save any links that are dropped in the chat. We'll also collect all the links from the chat and under recent presentations, I'll show you at the end of the uh, present uh, the morning today um, where you can find our resource sheets. And so you can also find those links there. So if you're not familiar with the UCCE San Bernardino County Master Gardeners, we're part of the University of California under the Agriculture and Natural Resources Division. So we're not part of UCR or UC Irvine or LA or UC Davis. We're a different division, but within that division, we have a number of programs. Master Gardeners are trained volunteers who educate the public by sharing peer-reviewed research done by the University of California and other universities. In our county, we like to focus on growing food, sustainable landscaping, and better living through gardening. But all that fancy talk is just a way to say that we're enthusiastic plant people, we're cheerleaders for gardens, and we wanna get research-based information out to the public. And we love to support you in all of your gardening adventures. We learn from you and we like to share what we've learned as well. In addition to the Master Gardener Program, each county in California has a cooperative extension office. You might've heard of extension offices, UCCE, and so San Bernardino County Cooperative Extension Office has the Master Gardeners, and as the name sounds, it's a cooperative agreement between the University of California and each county. So we have in our county Master Gardeners, Master Food Preservers. I'm a recent graduate of the Master Food Preserver Program. I'm really excited to learn about that. And they collaborate with us on this um, uh, school and community garden, or they work with us on this school and community garden collaborative. So you'll be hearing from them at future presentations. We also have a nutrition education program, FNEP, and then 4-H, which many of you have probably heard of, um, is also part of our cooperative extension program. In addition to the master, uh, in, in addition to these programs, we also have advisors as well. So for today's agenda, just a little welcome. At 9:10, we're going to have Debbie Schnorr, who I'm going to introduce in just a moment, talk about soil building. We have our featured speaker, Stephen Cantu, who's gonna talk about friendly, inclusive gardening. We're so excited to have him join us from San Diego. And Debbie will tell you a little bit more about him. I'm gonna talk about our Seed Library in Every Community project. And then we're gonna hear from the Inland Empire Resource Conservation District about some of the things they're doing in the community. And then we have resource sharing, where I'm gonna share a few resources and programs we have with you. 
And if you have anything you'd like to share with us, please feel free to do that. And so I had to put a picture of myself because I always forget to introduce myself. My name is Maggie O'Neill. I've been with the University of California with the Master Gardener program as a volunteer since 2016 and became the coordinator a few years later. So I'm the Master Gardener program coordinator. I'm also with the San Bernardino County Farm Bureau. So working on the agriculture side as well. And I'm gonna do a few uh, or one of the presentations and I'm uh, hosting with Debbie here today. And Debbie was a Master Gardener volunteer as well, but we were able to encourage and invite into our um, cooperative extension office as an employee. She is the San Bernardino County Environmental Education Coordinator, and I really enjoy working with her. You may have worked with her at school gardens. If you are part of a school garden and joining from a school garden today, then Debbie Schnorr is gonna be your contact person for getting those school gardens going. She's also working on our hydroponics project, which I'll talk a little bit more about at the end. And she's starting or has started a composting uh, project in response to the SB 1383 legislation and just the fact that composting is a great thing to do. So without further ado, Debbie, I think I'm gonna hand it over to you for you to share about building your soil. Welcome, Debbie. <laughs> Thanks, Maggie. I'm just showing myself here um, just to show that I'm a real person and then I'm going to stop my video. And now I am going to share my presentation. And while Debbie brings that up, if you've just joined us, feel free to drop in the chat uh, wh what city you're joining from if you'd like to, but you can also drop what organization you're joining from. And we welcome and are really excited to have everyone here today. Thanks for joining. And you started the recording, Maggie? Uh, yeah, the recording is in pro progress. Okay. All right. Can everybody see my presentation? Looks good. All right. And what we'll do is if for anybody who has questions, uh, we'll take the questions at the end if time allows. Okay. So think of your questions as she's going along and feel free to drop those in the chat. All right, and I will turn uh, admitting people from the waiting room to you, Maggie. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, so let's get going. Um, I want to thank you all again for attending our school and community garden collaborative workshop. Uh, we hold these quarterly. Um, as Maggie mentioned, I'm a UCCE San Bernardino Master Gardener and also the Environmental Education Coordinator. And believe it or not, fall starts next week and it's time to prepare your soil for fall and winter planning. And I want to um, thank and acknowledge Maggie for putting the information for this presentation together. All right, so first let's talk about what your plants need from the soil. Um, three main things, water, air, and nutrients and soil contains a wide variety of macro or microorganisms such as bacteria and fungi and these microorganisms or microbes uh, help promote plant growth and also prevent uh, disease by their activities in the soil. So soil type or what we call texture also plays a role. Um, soil consists of sand, silt, and clay particles, and the texture is the relative proportions of each. So sandy loam is one of the best types of soil for most plants, and you can do a jar test at home to determine what type of soil you have. So just Google soil jar test and you'll find all kinds of uh, details and instructions. So one thing to note is some plants actually do well in poor soils, uh, particularly natives. So it's important to choose the right plant for your conditions or make the conditions right for you, what you uh, intend to plant. So what do we mean by soil building? Well, it's a series of steps to uh, make your soil ready for planting. So the first step is to add organic matter, um, such as compost, to make sure there's biodiversity in the soil. And those are all those microorganisms I just talked about. 
then we want to make sure that the soil has the right texture and also uh, the right water holding capacity for the plants that we want to grow. So for instance, sandy soil drains water much faster than clay soil. So you want a combination of those different types of materials, sand, silt, and clay to get the right water holding capacity. And finally, uh, we wanna make sure that the beds are properly filled because we wanna maximize the amount of soil in the bed or container so that we have room for uh, the roots to grow but we don't want our bed or container to overflow when the plants are watered or it rains. And one thing to consider is that uh, soil tends to compact over time. So you will need to um, add, uh, most likely add each season. So soil building depends on the situation. So one um, scenario is new plantings where you're starting from scratch to create the best soil for what you're planting. Uh, an example is starting a new bed or container. Another scenario is refreshing uh, your bed, your in-ground plot, uh, your container um, that's already been uh, planted. And examples include planting for fall after the summer crops been harvested or a better container that's been uh, unused for a while. It's been dormant and you wanna bring it back. And then the third case is refreshing soil for perennial plants that have been in the ground for multiple uh, years or seasons. And those would include things like perennial herbs such as sage and rosemary, uh, fruit trees, any kind of tree, uh, shrubs. So just a reminder of uh, what, what soil needs refreshing for fall. Uh, to summarize, uh, beds or containers that, that have had a fruit or vegetable crop this summer, uh, beds or containers that have uh, sat empty for one or more seasons, um, soil uh, where perennials were growing for many seasons, and also um, soil that has not been producing well. So it may um, lack the texture or the nutrients that the plants need to grow. So let's start with um, soil building for new plants. And um, this is really important uh, for growing and maintaining uh, healthy plants and it shouldn't be overlooked. Uh, we all wanna get those fall plants in the ground as soon as possible, but it's worth spending some time and money to make sure that the soil is going to nourish those plants. You don't want to uh, spend money on seeds or plants and then not have them thrive. So if you're planting in the ground or a raised bed, uh, you may start with some native soil uh, in a raised bed in particular, the top six to 12 inches is the most important. So you can put the good stuff on the top. Uh, then you would add either um, potting mix. Uh, you can add potting mix, you can add potting soil, or sometimes it's called uh, raised bed soil, top soil uh, for texture and structure. And then you add compost uh, to um, get those organic materials into your soil for your uh, microorganisms. And you can also include some amendments like uh, peat moss, vermiculite, perlite to loosen the soil. Just make sure that you mix those components well uh, before you plant. Next, I wanna talk about building soil in existing beds or containers, either unused or used during the previous season. So settling and decomposition occurs over time. So it's usually necessary to uh, top off your bed or container. Um, if there's a lot of organic uh, matter in the bed or container, such as old plants and leaves, uh, you're gonna need to add some soil in there to improve the structure and to reduce uh, settling. Um, after adding the soil, add about two inches of compost to the surface and then mix it in uh, with the top four to six inches of soil. 
Um, there's many different composts available. Uh, some examples are uh, cow and chicken manure, mushroom compost, worm castings. You can find all of these at your local big box store or nursery. And a combination of these different types of composts is best. And then to maintain moisture um, and discourage weeds, add a few inches of mulch on the top. And the photo on this slide shows just how much soil can settle over time. This is the same picture that was shown a few slides ago. So, um, you know, especially in a container, you can see that soil level go down uh, maybe even 50% uh, in a season or two. So if there's uh, perennial plants uh, that are gonna stay in the bed, you want to avoid disturbing the roots when you're mending the soil. So as before, you're gonna spread mulch over the surface. Uh, mulch, you don't wanna mix in with the soil cause it's going to bind with the nitrogen and keep it from the roots of the plants. Uh, you could also use uh, compost as a mulch or in addition to mulch. And when you spread mulch, you want to avoid burying the stem of the plant uh, and keep it away from tree trunks so that you don't get um, decay and disease in your plants. So this photo shows a bed with um, several kinds of perennials in it. And you just want to add a little bit of compost and or mulch uh, to the surface. And that's all you really need to do so you don't disturb the roots. So um, what if your bed is going to uh, sit empty in the fall? Um, consider rather than just leaving it um, on its own, consider cover cropping it to add nutrients and prevent erosion. Um, some examples of cover crops are clover and fava beans, and these can add nitrogen to the soil. Uh, just make sure that you're using a non-invasive plant as a cover crop or else you're gonna um, spend a lot of time getting that out of the ground when you decide to plant something else. And cover crops are great because they attract beneficial predators and pollinators. So if you wanna learn more about cover crops in your area, we have a couple of links here. Uh, one good resource is the Cal Flora website. Um, it's also called the NRCS California eVeg Guide and NRCS stands for Natural Resources Conservation Service. And one thing to remember is that most native plants, once established, do not need mulch or fertilizer. And that is the beauty of native plants. You can uh, leave them alone and they're just going to do fine. So really, you don't need to do uh, much of anything for soil building for natives. So here are some general tips on keeping your soil healthy. Uh, proper watering is really key. So if you overwater, you're going to reduce the amount of oxygen that gets to the plant roots um, and also those beneficial microorganisms. And it makes plants uh, more susceptible to pathogens because they can start decaying. Um, underwatering is also, um, also a problem because it causes roots and microorganisms to die. It can make the soil hydrophobic and that's a condition where it's going to repel water rather than absorb water. And as I mentioned previously, uh, mulch keeps the moisture in, uh, it keeps the weeds out. It also keeps the soil temperature uh, more consistent both when it's hot and cold. And then you want to avoid over fertilizing um, because that'll put salts and chemicals into the soil and those can run off into water sources. And to um, reduce pests, you really want to um, limit the use of pesticides and use integrated pest management practices, IPM. And IPM focuses on the long-term prevention of pests and the damage that they cause by managing the whole ecosystem. So if you're interested in learning more, you can go to the UC IPM website. Um, and then use compost to improve all types of soils. It's really the miracle ingredient that improves water retention and sandy soil, water drainage, clay soil, and it's gonna add that great organic matter to 
um, to your soil. And then um, adding water and organic matter uh, like compost keeps your soil active and alive. You know, it's really a living system. If you don't build your soil on a regular basis, the microorganisms will die and you don't really have like a healthy soil, you just have plain dirt that is not gonna nourish the plants. So I want to end uh, this presentation with some tips to uh, improve poor soil. So again, compost is the miracle ingredient. If you have heavy soil, sandy soil, hydropo hydrophobic soil, just add compost. And the same with compacted soil. You just need to break it up as little as possible, just enough to be able to add that compost. Uh, if your soil is lacking in nutrients, uh, it will need some compost and maybe some fertilizer as well. And you uh, may need to add some amendments to adjust the pH. Uh, there are home tests and pH meters you can buy to uh, check the pH. Uh, in most cases, the pH needs to be really far off before it becomes a problem. And then if your soil is waterlogged, you want to let it dry, then loosen it as you would for compacted soil, add your compost and amendments. Uh, the important thing probably for all of these issues is to really get to uh, the bottom of it to find out, you know, why is this happening? For instance, if you have soggy soil, why is it wet? Has it been overwatered? Is it the composition of your soil? Do you have too much clay? So things like that. And then um, if you wanna learn more about soil, uh, we have videos on many different topics, uh, including mulching and composting. So you can check out our UCCE San Bernardino uh, YouTube channel uh, for videos on soil building and many more topics. We're adding new material all the time, uh, including the recording of this workshop and other presentations. So if you have questions about your soil or any other gardening topic, feel free to call our Master Gardener helpline, or you can also send them an email. And if you send them an email, you can send photos that um, show what your issue is. Um, we have a few minutes left. If anyone has any questions you'd like to ask now, please put them in the chat and Maggie will read them off to me. Um, so I'd like to thank you for attending our workshop. Any so let's give, if anybody has anybody they wanted, anybody, anything they wanna drop in the chat, um, feel free to, or if you'd like to unmute yourself. Um, we have a good size group, but I think we still can, if you guys would like to unmute and ask a question, um, you're welcome to do that. And otherwise, I think we'll, uh, we'll give people just a minute if they're typing or waiting for me to stop talking so they can uh, drop a question or unmute. Um, then we'll do that. And Debbie, I'll, uh, okay, so there's a question in the chat. Is there a resource for quality compost in the Inland Empire? Great question. Um, let's see. I know that I have seen um, lists. Uh, the Chino Basin Water Conservation District had uh, they had a um, class on irrigation, and they actually had a really nice uh, list of places to get soil and compost. So. Um, I think I can, um, I'll talk to Maggie about that. We can probably share that out. That sounds great. Yeah, they have uh, the second, what is it? The first and third Saturday of every month. Um, they have, if you're in the Montclair at area at all, the first and third Saturday of every month from seven to 10 or seven to nine, you can come and get compost. It's really good quality compost. They also have mulch. Um, I know that Highland, was giving away compost. I'm not sure the quality. I haven't seen it. Um, and there's definitely, as the SB 1383 legislation is asking cities to reduce waste. Um, Debbie, maybe you can expand. I don't know if the cities are required to leave part of it in their city, or can you expand? Yes, a little bit you on know that? all all the uh, organic waste that is coming from cities. Uh, the legislation does require 
the city to use it locally. So usually they partner with their waste haulers um, to uh, provide mulch for the city. So I know that uh, most cities are working on that now. If you have a community or school garden, uh, you may be able to go to your local waste hauler and ask them if they would be willing to contribute some mulch and our mulch and compost. And those things you can get at your big box stores. You can get pretty high quality, but it's gonna cost you more in some cases if you just get it by the bag. And also there are, they are kind of limited in the numbers of the types of compost that they have, so. Great, and if you follow us, uh, not trying to plug our social media, I mean, I am trying to plug our social media, but uh, I do uh, try to pretty actively stay on top of partners within the county when they're sharing compost days. So if you do follow us on Facebook, then uh, I try to post when those are coming up and I see those. Um, and then there was another question Somebody asked about the name of the legislation and our partners type that in. So thank you. And then there was another question um, and we have a presentation on our YouTube channel that goes more into that in, um, in depth. And then we're also doing upcoming workshops about that. So if you're curious about more of that and Debbie is gonna start a really cool program where she is um, working with communities to sort of help them find out what resources as far as composting, how those cities are collecting compost, where, where community gardens might be that might be willing to take your compost, like Route 66, for example. So she's gonna work on connecting you guys with those resources. Okay, it's 9.30, but one more question. Can I start planting for fall right after building the soil or should I wait a few days? Um, I think as long as your compost um, has been aged and most of the ones that you can buy commercially have been aged, uh, usually about a year or at least a few months, uh, yes, you can. Um, and I also wanna emphasize that you can make your own compost. It really is not, we, we have some composting workshops. We have many videos uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can take uh, the kitchen scraps and garden trimmings that you have in your own yard and start your own compost pile. And as long as you let it, um, you let it age for a bit, a couple of months, uh, you can use it uh, in your garden. Great, well, I don't see any other questions, um, but composting and soil building and composting, right? That's a hot topic, pun intended, right? Um, Stephen, if you do, uh, by the time Debbie introduces you, if you need a few more minutes after your 1030 slot, we've allowed a little bit of time for that. So we really definitely want to hear from you. Debbie, um, you want to yes, introduce Yes, I'd uh, like Stephen? to introduce my new friend, uh, Stephen mm -hmm. Cantu. Uh, I'm honored to introduce him as our guest speaker. Uh, he is with the Master Gardener Association of San Diego County. And he's been a master gardener since 2008. Uh, he's a journeyman carpenter, a wheelchair athlete, a two-time Paralympian. He gardens on a two acre plot in Bonita where he maintains more than 35 fruit trees, a large cactus garden and raised garden beds. Uh, if you have not seen his garden, I highly recommend that you go to YouTube, type friendly inclusive gardening into the search bar uh, take a virtual tour of his garden. It is truly, truly amazing. So today, Stephen's going to talk to us about how we can make gardening friendly and accessible for all. So thank you so much for joining us, Stephen. Well, thank you. So let's get this thing up and going. Um, oops. I think I need to share the screen somehow. Yes. Uh, and same for Stephen as he gets his PowerPoint together, or not together, but gets it up and we can see it, Stephen, it looks good. Then if you have any uh, questions for Stephen, then um, you can uh, feel free to ask those at the end of the presentation. So take it away. We're so excited to have you. Well, thank you very much. Um, Debbie, I really enjoyed your, uh, your, your topic. I'm going to be starting uh, a new program um, because this one... Um, needs to re um, get revamped every so often. And I'm gonna be doing sustainability and accessibility. Um, 
together and I'll be starting this after I finish with a presentation to the uh, International Master Gardener Convention in Kansas City next summer. So um, I may be looking at your uh, information to incorporate that because it was nicely condensed and um, nicely presented. So thank you for that. It's, um, it's gonna be a fun project. So, okay. Um, designing friendly, inclusive gardening. Um, I developed this with San Diego Master Gardeners. Um, it was slow at first, but it, it's come along nicely and I'm getting um, good responses back. So if anybody um, has a critique, negative, good, bad, whatever, um, you can email, email me at contu at cox.net with um, any input, I would appreciate that because I'm always looking for uh, other uh, uh, interpretations as to what we're doing here and everybody has their, um, their, uh, their input. That's the inclusive part. Um, so friendly basically means uh, safe, easy to work. Inclusive is allowing for everybody abilities, cognitive and physical, and aging to be part of the garden and garden spaces is just garden spaces. So that's FIG, Friendly Inclusive Gardening. Um, a little bit about me, initially um, I was in the trades um, as a young man in my mid twenties, 26 years old when I was injured on a job site and I fell three stories off a bridge product, uh, project in the San Jose area end up breaking a leg, a pelvis, a couple ribs, and my back in three places, which left me a paraplegic. Um, I was um, fortunate enough to uh, be able then to press the reset button on, um, on my life and make the transition to, first through wheelchair sports, and then um, the master gardeners in San Diego years later, um, uh, allowed me to um, run with this program, and um, it's been a it's been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So that's my uh, behind the scenes story. Um, now we're going to start talking about um, um, designing these these gardens. So um, we're going to discuss uh, the path to travel, which you can see just a little bit of my garden right here, and um, materials and design ideas and signage and tools and universal design principles, which is the very last um, little video. And then hopefully we'll have time for um, questions and um, maybe a, a coherent answer or two, but we'll find out. Uh, but what I wanna show you guys next is some oddities. And for guys like me, these oddities really create um, some issues in the gar in, in our ability to get around the town and what people do. So this is the first one, and we can see what's going on here, and this is easily fixed, but somebody spent mutual dollars on uh, putting it into this little ramp, and, um, and then uh, somebody decided to have a design change. So that's just one. And now this one is obvious and it's beyond words uh, when I see things like this. But um, on the right, I mean, this is um, a quick way to the grave, quite frankly. To the left, it's just ridiculous, but this is what happens. And of course, this is, I've encountered numerous times. And what do you do? I go find some pebbles and I toss them at the window to get people's attention. I, I, I have no words for this. Again. And I was giving this presentation to some school kids and there was a kid there who spoke and could read the, um, this, uh, this language and uh, pretty much said, yeah, it means accessible path, which it does, but it's, um, mm, let's just say, understated to the danger of what's going on here. 
And again, I um, just have to, uh, to restate that uh, we have rules, we have information out there and people tend to um, ignore that because they think they know better and, and you end up with something as silly as this. Okay, so let's start talking about the path to travel. The path to travel uh, would be in school gardens or home gardens or your community garden. It would be from say at the home where you park your vehicle to how you get around the home and how you get around your garden. School gardens and community gardens where you park your vehicle, how you get to public restrooms, because I feel as though a fundamental right of a community or school garden is access to a, a, a restroom. Um, the path to travel also means um, where you store your tools, how you store your tools, and how you get them to your work site. And we'll be talking a little more detail about that. Um, and of course, the path of travel is what you have on the path. And in this case, I had access to um, about 24 tons of roadbed material. And I put this down because it was considerably cheaper than um, DG or decomposed granite. And particularly when you add in the um, um, compression or the uh, amendment that allows it to, to bind and stay in place. So this goes in first, and then a lesser amount of DG with the amendment uh, will go on top of it. And I probably saved a ton of money doing this, but this is crust stone. And so we'll look a little closer at it. And this crust stone is concrete, uh, that was brought in from job sites, uh, ground up, and um, where it was soft, and you can see on this screen here, there's a little bit of divots that was formed from my chair. Um, but anything on wheels that use a path, which may be, say, a wheelbarrow or a garden cart or mama in a stroller or mama pushing a stroller or... Um, say grandma that wants to make a, uh, a trip in a wheelchair down here with, with help. So uh, everything on wheels would uh, cause a divot. And Debbie, when you're talking about ordering more materials, my general rule of thumb is um, to have about 20% more materials because here in San Diego, and I'm assuming the same thing is, um, in your area, the big cost is um, delivery. So you might as well upfront order more. And then when you need it, um, you, um, you got it handy. You don't have to have pay another delivery charge. And the way prices are going up around uh, here is uh, pretty much driving me crazy. Uh, the other thing on the path to travel that you gotta keep in mind is um, sharp, pointy, dangerous items. Now, obviously, I got that in spades. And um, I was kind of surprised that my cactus garden grew as quickly as it did. I expected it to be many years down the road before it got to this point. And one of the things that happened on my path to travel right back in here where you can't see, I had a yucca with very sharp um, uh, points on it. And it is slowly falling over into the path of travel. And uh, yesterday, I think it was, or the day before, I was out there and I wasn't paying attention. And it, it hit my left arm. And boy, I tell you, I had a couple bleeding spots and so on. So this is um, something. Stephen, I'm so sorry. I accidentally muted you trying to let somebody in. And these slides are beautiful. Can you unmute yourself? I'm so sorry. We are really enjoying your wonderful slides. There we go, okay. Stephen. So sorry okay. again. And But an All opportunity right. for me to tell you how much we're enjoying this. Okay, okay, okay. Well, um, so here we are. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so porny sticky things aren't good in, for most, most gardens. I like it. And I'm here in Southern California and I'm in Bonita. I'm a few miles from the coast, a few miles from the Mexican border. And so um, water is really pricey for me. Uh, we live in a coastal um, uh, desert and um, we, um, my water bill may run as high as $900 every two months. And so I'm doing everything I can to reduce it. And um, now that these are established, I don't water at all in this area. So the difference between crushed stone and pea gravel um, we got to keep in mind on um, the things that are really troublesome for me is um, gorilla hair, pea gravel, crust stone in some cases, um, gorilla hair, crust stone, uh, and wood chips. Now, a little caveat. If the pea gravel is worked into the ground, it's only an inch thick, that's fine. Same thing goes for... Um, uh, um, senior moment, excuse me, uh, wood chips. Um, wood chips are great, but once they work in the ground, then it's, it, it, it's pretty good. Gorilla hair is just a nuisance. Really good for the soil, really bad for guys like me because it just piles up in the front of the chair and makes a mess. Okay, so path of travel around um, a garden bed or around your raised garden bed. So obviously, I found this on the web the other day and um, I just thought, boy, is this a problem? Not only for guys like me who use a, a wheelchair for my mobility, but this is a problem for everybody. And one thing you got to keep in mind is what works for me is that much easier for everybody else. And um, so, look at the standards that are set up for uh, wheelchair users. Um, and you'll find that um, having ramps instead of steps, having wider spaces, uh, all seem to um, work a lot better for everybody. In particular, if you have a bunch of students who um, have a hard time sitting still, um, you will have to have wider paths around your beds and wider paths to travel to and from, like I said earlier, um, where you're bringing your materials in, where your restrooms are and uh, classroom and so on, all the need to be wider paths. So I, I found this, as I said, and I was just like kind of blown away of all the mistakes here, but I'm at the I'm of the age that when I was a child, we would they they talked about duck and cover for you know all the wrong reasons, but duck and cover was you know in case a nuclear bomb hit, you know, what are we gonna do? Um I've taken the, the approach that um by having wider beds and you're gonna need room to duck and cover, particularly when you give a shovel to a 10-year-old boy who um, decides that shovels anything but a shovel, um, you're gonna need room. So for safety standpoints, for just organizations of the class, a five foot minimum row, um, space between your beds, I think uh, is functional. ADA says three feet, but you're dealing with a classroom. Um, I, I re solid recommend it, at least five feet. So obviously in here, they have in here, maybe just a few inches here, maybe two feet. Uh, I don't see how something like this is reasonable, but it can be easily resolved by, and there's plenty of room here, of everything being moved out and giving width and access all the way around. This guy here um, put in some um, vertical growing. We're gonna talk a little more about that. But they did it a little wrong. The center one is just stupid. It just won't work. So keep them on the outside of the beds so you have full access all the way around. Um, and again, we'll talk a little bit about these pergola ideas, which I kind of like the way they look, but functionally, they are some issues. So keep in mind width and how you carry things when you're moving around the garden. The other thing I highly recommend 
And I have a hard time keeping my garden neat and clean and my wood shop. Um, it's, um, it's difficult and I understand the pitfalls for doing that. But the garden holes like this um, is just plain dangerous. One of my master gardener um, uh, 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 friends here in Bonita, her 90 year old mom went out to do something in the garden, tripped over garden holes and then ended up breaking, uh, I believe it was a shoulder and a hip. But um, uh, so these things have, you know, serious consequences and they shouldn't be overlooked. Um, and anybody at any time can fall. You know, most um, most children fall, roll, tumble, go down steps, and they get up, shake it off, and move on. For me, in my mid sixties, I go down, and I'm I'm eating ibuprofen for a week. You know, so it's something to keep in mind that you um, want to look at this safety feature. Okay, now in school gardens you got to keep certain things of safety in mind. Um, right here, these beds, I think, are a little low. If you kind of measure this man's knees here, um, you're talking that the height of that bed is somewhere under two feet. For most kids, that seems OK, but you see how this guy is and where it comes to him. Um, so he probably won't have a problem. He won't think twice about a sore back. Where this woman sitting here will probably show consequences of that. So we are going to talk later about heights of beds and, and, uh, and, and so on. So we'll get a little more into that. The other thing you want to keep in mind from a safety standpoint, this garden bed, and I love this little uh, design here, but um, there are some, some issues, and one of them being, uh, this is on top of asphalt. Asphalt is usually pretty good as a non-slippery surface, but here they painted it. So what are these beds? Great, but you can bet soil is gonna be coming out of the bottom here. On a painted surface, that will be a slipping hazard. So you need to keep that in mind for a safety standpoint. Um, okay, so let's move on. Now, most people, me included, even though I think I have a fairly decent income, I still can't afford something like this. You're talking many, maybe a, over, well, I don't even want to guess, but over a hundred thousand dollars in landscape design for something like this. But what I want to show here is, here's your travel, travel, path of travel coming through here, which is perfectly great. Um, but um, then you got little areas to sit and talk. And we all know as parents or as educators that there's times when you gotta have a place you can pull a kid or a family member or, or a husband or a wife and say, we need to talk. And um, uh, having it off the, the traveled path is, you know, it works out really well. So keep in mind a seating area that you can have that discussion. So when you see this, this garden design here, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Your eyes go to either these pillows or they go to this door. And that's great. That's one of the tenets of um, architectural design that you get drawn into your garden or get drawn into the house. And this path here is nice and smooth and pretty and everything you want. Now, as far as maintaining all this, I would just hire a crew to do it. I, I don't wanna do that. But, um, but you notice that you're going right towards the door here. I would prefer the, this to be a little more centered, but eh, I'm not an architect. So let's look at this garden. Where does your eyes go when you see the garden? it goes right to these red doors here, which is great. This is a you know, get drawn in, but what you don't see is this and these, and these are tripping hazards. It's a nice straight path. Everything's great, except if you're carrying something and most people carry things that harms out like this or, or here, 
but out here, if you can see that. And um, so you're not seeing where your feet are. And um, boom, down you go. And hopefully you're not carrying a barrel cactus or something like that when you go down. But um, that's something to keep in mind. So on this garden, absolutely stunning, beautiful. But imagine trying to carry something uh, or push your, your kid. You, know, you want to get your kid out in the garden. You got them in a stroller and... Uh, and maybe it's time to take a nap and you're trying to roll over this rough surface and bounce it, bounce it, bounce it. For me in a chair, um, I couldn't hold something on my lap and try to navigate through this area. Um, also, if you got a wheelbarrow full of stuff, it's going to be uncomfortable. Lots of times I refer to these stones as um, tripping stones. And um, so, Keep that in mind when you're on your, your path to travel, what the surface is and how you're gonna move about and what is the safest, safest way of doing that. So now, okay. So uh, this garden, um, I thought at first I started looking at it going, well, that's really kind of a neat idea, but what's wrong with it? Well, first of all, we'll look at this. And I like the way they look, particularly if they have um, some sort of vine growing up over this and you know, it kind of makes for a nice entrance. But I carry things across my lap and many times people are carrying things into their workspace. And if this isn't wide enough, you have to stop, reorganize. I end up just throwing shovels and tools around just to get them through areas that are too tight when, um, when that uh, uh, comes, comes about. So keep in mind, if you're gonna put this, uh, uh, this type of structure in your garden, um, make it wide enough that you can get through it. Now, maybe you guys have noticed what these are here. These are wine bottles. Uh, wine bottles, I highly discourage this um, for a safety standpoint. And first of all, do you really want friends and neighbors and family to know you acquired this much wine? Eh, maybe, maybe not. But most people I know here in San Diego and other places in Southern California, they garden in flip-flops and sometimes barefooted, sometimes in sandals. Um, and one of these gets cracked or broken and you can have your day ruined and your time in the garden cut really short if you end up getting an injury from something like that. So pay attention. Um, this can be very, very dangerous. Um, second thing is, I talked about the five foot space around the garden. And I talked about pea gravel with this is I talked about wood chips, for a standpoint of mobility and working around this. Um, it is problematic. You can't get into this area. It's hard to get tools and equipment into this area. They do have a good idea of a seating bench here, but there is a tripping hazard right here. So all that should be taken into consideration when you're designing and using an existing garden. Uh, so pay attention. It can be um, lovely, but dangerous. So here's another one. Again, pea gravel. Like I said, I reiterate that if it's a inch thick or, and working into the ground, not too bad. Um, but if it's six or seven inches thick, which I've come across, it's impossible for anything on wheels. The other thing here that people don't seem to uh, catch on Beautiful view, beautiful colors, chairs, everything just looks great. But when plants grow into your path to travel and you have to move them to get your wheelbarrow through here or whatever else, your, your garden cart or whatever you're pulling through your garden, you have to get up and move uh, the plants. Uh, cucumbers, pumpkins, all those things will break if you're not extremely careful. Um, these plants that are here right now, what they're doing is they're a 
shifting your view to a tripping hazard. And if you're not paying attention, that could be problematic. So again, safety, part of friendliness in the garden. So it's something to keep in mind. Oops, I should have done that at first, but you can get a better view of what's going on here. Um, I view raised beds more for uh, food production. Here they're doing ornamentals and other things, but yeah, that's okay. Um, whatever your thing is. So knowing your materials, this is really important. I worked in the trades for a, a good number of years. And in the last 40 years, I, from my chair and my wood shop uh, around my house and in other people's homes, I've done a lot of woodworking building raised beds and so on. And many times I've gotten splinters from um, uh, treated materials. They almost always get infected. I've um, been very lucky that I can easily take care of that, remove the splinter and the infection goes away. But for somebody who's older, has a, an immune system that is, um, let's just say not up to power, um, it can be life-threatening. So you got to pay attention to that. The other thing is, and we'll talk about it more uh, in a second, but um, treated materials uh, have a lot of chemicals in them. If you're touching those things and touching your food, pay attention because you're introducing it to your body. Um, here, this is at the Blind Center in San Diego, it, it, in La Jolla, I should say. It has been moved and I don't know what they're doing now, but this little uh, corner here was set up for um, keeping people from running into that. And, and I don't think it really worked, but what I did when I had my raised beds out of wood, I cut the corners here and then rounded them off. And I thought that worked a lot better than what you see going here. Um, Okay, so, oops, that wasn't what I thought. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Um, now, on these raised beds, um, one of the things you got to keep in mind is that um, this, first of all, this is a commercial garden attached to a restaurant in La Jolla. Um, so it's a little larger than what you would have in a home garden. Uh, and, um, but keep in mind, take away from it what you need and you don't have to do anything this way. It's really too much for uh, uh, most homes to, to deal with, but they have several neat features here that I wanted to point out. Um, a little bit of vertical gardening back here, which is very necessary. Uh, a good path to travel with DG allows you a good space to uh, in between the beds and you can easy access all the way around. You've got a seating area over here. Uh, they had grapes growing over this area, which you know got you out of the sun. They also had some uh, 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 water uh, that's also, also very important, particularly in school gardens, to have an area where kids can make sure they, they hydrate and they have um, an area to cool off, particularly people who have some disabilities in which they um, have difficulties like I do regulating their heat. You guys are up in an area that's a little warmer uh, than in coastal San Diego. Um, so you really have to pay attention to that. I grew up in Calexico, the Imperial Valley. I know heat, that's why I'm in San Diego. When I saw it 125 degrees in Imperial Valley, when I was in my, um, about 17, 18 years old, I just said, I ain't, I ain't doing this. So I tried to keep hydrated. I tried to keep my body um, cool. It's difficult, but having a shaded area really helps. What you got to keep in mind here also, particularly in a, uh, in a school garden, is to number the beds. One, two, three, four, five. And this, oops, 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 oops. And, um, uh, you number these beds one through five, and then wherever your timer is, your controller um, also have a clipboard there with the numbers on it, so you understand that 
uh, you send somebody in, turn on bed number three, and he can look over there, she can look over there and say, oh, bed number three um, is that one, and it's clearly marked next to your timer, and you can easily uh, control that. I also highly recommend that if you put the irrigation valves in these raised beds, that you put it high enough, like I did all of mine, and not in the ground, but in the bed and up high, so that when you have to do some repair on it, and believe me, you have to do repair. On my home, I had 40 valves on three separate timers over two acres. And if anybody says you can remember where those are, they're delusional. You can't. I had a few choice beds I remembered, but keeping all 40 in mind, it's it just not going to happen. So having things numbered, having the numbering core um, uh, uh, in, in uh, easy access where the timer is or the multiple timer boxes are is really important. Again, keep the valves out of the ground. That's just a good home for bees and spiders and nobody wants to get down in the ground to do repairs on that. And having them up high is uh, very beneficial. Okay. Uh, this one, you know, I got my slides backwards. I'm going to have to fix this. This was supposed to be right after the other one. But here is um, railroad ties. Under no circumstances should this be at the home and obviously not in a school or community garden. Most school gardens um, uh, will say no railroad ties. And it's a good reason for it. Um, creosote is a known cancer-causing agent. Most a lot of people say, oh, it's not a problem. It won't leach into the soil. Well, I don't know if that's true or not. But um, what I do know, if you're sitting on this thing or your hands are touching the creosote, then you're touching food. To me, that's a problem. So avoid these things. From the standpoint of construction in which I worked with these things way too often, very heavy very hard to cut, uh, very hard on tools. And so don't do it. it it's, it's, it's just a nuisance. There are several other features here. People always want to put a guy in a wheelchair in uh, a U-shaped thing, thing. Look at that, you can get all around. There are numerous problems I have found with these U-shaped things. One, if you can't turn around in there and you have to back out, that is a hazard. Um, backing out is backing up uh, is one I usually fall over. And um, then it's a nuisance to get back in my chair. As I get older, I find it more and more difficult. When I was younger, I basically just simply, um, you know, rearrange things and, you know, put myself back or hopped in the chair and carried on. Now, a little, little more troublesome. Um, there's a couple other things that we've got to keep in mind here. Hose, I'm always against garden hoses as a tripping hazard. This path here isn't wide enough, and there's crushed stone or pea gravel here, which makes it difficult to maneuver around. Uh, and then once you get a wheelbarrow close in here, there's not much room to do anything else. So um, I'm not a real fan of these U-shaped things. Uh, there is another issue is you can't get around over in here, which means that this area is difficult to maintain, and that would be for anybody. Second thing is, no matter if you're using a chair or a walker or able body or whatever, this concrete strip here means, and I can almost guarantee that there's probably an inch Ah, oh, there we go. There's probably an inch difference between this and the ground level, if not more, or the lawn level. So if you're sitting there with your uh, uh, feet at uh, uh, the balls of your feet are uh, up higher than, than the back of your foot, then that's an uncomfortable way to sit and stand. And, and so it's going to be difficult for a person to, to work from this end here because of this this concrete strip. 
So, you know, keep all those things in mind when you're designing your garden. Again, creosote uh, is a no-no. Don't even think about it. It is just, it's a bad idea. Okay, so I really like this barn door. I put one of these in on my greenhouse when I built that. And it works out great in my garden storage. Uh, uh, um, I did not build these. I should change it. I just haven't been able to do that. I've been too busy with everything else. But um, but when I approach a barn door like this, and I I'm, hopefully I can explain this right, but you roll up to it and you simply just move it out of the way. And then you, uh, if it's ramped, like my uh, uh, greenhouse is, then you simply, you know, bounce right in. The ramp to something like this needs to be about an eight degree uh, angle, or another way of looking at it, it can be uh, for every inch of rise, you have 12 foot of run. Uh, that was the old measurement. And for homes, um, it um, would probably be fine for most people. Uh, for commercial operations, schools, and so on, now for every inch of rise, you have 20 inches of run. So if that makes sense to you guys, you come up an inch, you go out, the length is 20 inches. So do the math. If you come up six inches, then you're talking quite a bit of distance on a 20-inch run. You may only have room for a 12-inch run. So do the math and pay attention to it. But uh, it should be a platform that's flat right under uh, uh, the, the, the door, the, the sliding door. So you get up there, you sit on a flat surface, you simply roll the door open, and then you go on in. Inside the shed, um, where you hang your tools, then um, I'm a huge proponent, proponent of this, and I wish I practiced it more, um, but um, I find it difficult in my shop because it's just me, and um, things tend to get, um, um, let's just say, I, I, I don't always preach, I always don't practice what I preach, and I wish I did, but um, number your tools. For example, shovels, let's put a number three on the shovel and then where it hangs is also number three. And for the kids, go get the shovel. It's number three, go get it, bring it here and put it back in the same spot. And uh, by numbering things, it comes in really handy of uh, storing your equipment um, and things get put back. Uh, in my shop, I. Um, I tend to, right now I'm working restoring a, an Airstream. And so a lot of the tools go into the Airstream. At the end of the day, they come back in the shop, they get piled. And before I know it, uh, I have a huge mess and I can't find everything. And that really diminishes from the um, quality of your work and the time to get it done. Okay, so one of the things I also strongly, and I'm doing this, and it doesn't look anywhere this nice. So don't think that. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm uh, got it all right, but I'm I'm working on this idea, having espalade gardens for a guy uh, who has mobility issues or for anybody. It's just a lot easier to deal with. Um, you're not getting up on a ladder to get the fruit off. You're keeping it at a nice, uh, nice eye level in a lot of cases to grab it, move it, and so on. It, unfortunately, it is also easy for birds to find your fruit, but you know, I, my idea is to plant enough for everybody and so be it, you know. But almost any fruit tree, um, you can do this too. Uh, excuse me, and it will um, be beneficial. These pears on the left here are just extraordinary, uh, well done. You go on the, on the web and you just type in, uh, uh, Espalay, uh, you'll find a number of different patterns and, and um, uh, that the Europeans, I think, primarily have developed. And um, uh, it, it really is a, a nice way of doing it for mobility purposes. Uh, 
Okay, so here's another idea of vertical gardening. I would bring, oh, Steve, I would bring the garden, this thing down a little bit so you're not reaching up. I'm having problems with my neck now and my lower back. So I tend to keep things, um, uh, I like to keep things basically at shoulder level and down where I'm not bending over. So one of the things that a gardener must do is evaluate their abilities and also look to the future what you think your needs will be. The most difficult part is being honest with yourself and doing that. And so um, keep in mind that we are all aging and as we age with physical activity becomes more difficult and um, recovery time is more difficult. And I'm really finding that out now. Um, and I tried to prepare for it and it's coming along, but there's always tweaks and methods and things are going about it. But anyway, if this was a little lower, it'd be easier for this gentleman to work. But the idea is you're working at eye level and uh, it's um, uh, it will be more efficient and easier on your body to do that. Now, to me, this is just garden art. I just love the way this looks and um, it's easy to get to, easy to maintain and so on. The heavier gourds and so on, you got, if you're doing this too, you got to tie them up and um, uh, make sure they're not too heavy and they break. But basically, this is a great way of doing things. Okay, so keeping critters out. Um, God, I think it's been 10 years now, but I had the privilege and my wife and I traveled in uh, Southern Africa. And we were in uh, South Africa, uh, in numerous places, and in uh, Zimbabwe and in Botswana. And I got to visit a, a, a man in Zimbabwe and he was a local low level chief and a witch doctor and all this sort of stuff. So it was interesting talking with him. And he had a garden that um, was behind this huge barrier. I mean, I was just amazed. I said, what's that? And he said, well, I got a problem with uh, zebras, warthogs and elephants. And I thought for a minute, and then I had to bite my tongue because at that time in my home in Bonita, I was having problems with bunnies. And um, so, I mean, you know, you gotta work with what you got. I, I, you know, if you got an elephant in your garden, that's just a whole other problem that I don't wish to deal with. Uh, but um, speaking to a, a niece of mine in Patagonia, Arizona, runs a gardening nonprofit business there and uh, they have huge problems with um, pickery and pickery burrow under fences and they get in the garden make a mess of things and it's a you guys don't anybody doesn't know what a pickery is it's basically a pig like animal um, but it's um, um it's a real problem in eastern sierras where i spend my uh, good parts of my summers I have friends up there and they have problems with black bear uh, coming in the garden. And one friend of mine uh, gardening uh, uh, south of Mammoth uh, had a problem with black bear, deer and mountain lions coming through their garden. So they had to in, uh, surround everything with electric fences that were strong enough to keep a bear out. And I tell you, bears are pretty darn smart, California black bears, and they'll figure out a way of dealing with this. But let's get back to this. Ooh. So th this bed here, from a standpoint of a, of a person who has, um, uh, let's just say uh, weaker trunk muscles. So you have to bend down lift this guy up and then with your other hand, lift up this two by and um, then hold this up and then stick your head into that thing and try to do whatever you're doing. Now, at that point, you got to make sure that that kid with that shovel doesn't come around the corner and knock down that two by four and, and leave you, you know, trapped in there. So one of the other issues then from safety standpoint is something like that with kids. One of the leading injuries 
is smashing injuries with kids and small hands. So if that thing were to come down and uh, uh, hit a kid's knuckles, it could be a huge hills problem. So here is my wife and some raised beds that I acquired, and she wanted to keep the rats out. And we have a huge problem here. There's a lot of open spaces around my property and um, uh, rodents, you know, rats, mice, lately raccoons in my garden uh, are causing real problems. So I built this thing up and it's hard to see. Um, oh, it's hard to see, but um, I got hinges right here and these doors open up like this. And once they open up, you can easily get in there and, and do what you're doing and so on. The other thing I did here to keep um, uh, my wife's back out, uh, healthy is that I built this up on platforms. And now this is treated materials, but I figured that in this case, they wouldn't be touched and they wouldn't be transferred and it wouldn't be worried about splinters. But the way I built this, come on cursor, is that I set this back so that it's like a toe kick that's five and a half inches. So you can get your toes in here at the same time, um, able to get close into this and not bend over. So you can see right here, um, my wife can get up next to this and not do any bending. So Jan is um, quite happy with that and I built this saying, yes, it keeps the rats out. Um, but for some odd reason, as soon as I built this, the rats disappeared. I don't know why. Um, and now we got a raccoon. Um, so over here, she said, don't build it. Um, so I did it. And it, the problem is, um, um, you know, it works, it keeps the, the, the mice and the rodents out and uh, it, it does a pretty decent job. I'm pretty happy with that. And just so you know, the, um, oh, the, um, this um, quarter inch mesh or uh, wire cloth goes all the way around, it's across the top too. And um, one of the comments I had was, um, Boy, you could put a rabbit in there and it could uh, eat down everything and fertilize your, your bed at the same time. You know, um, and that's probably true. Okay, so let's move on. Flutter. And we kind of spoke about that earlier, but when areas aren't used as much as um, like every 10 minutes, tends to get any flat surface tends to be a catch-all. And I found it kind of interesting, this little raised bed right here um, isn't very accessible. You can't get in to use it. This sign is talking about how raised beds are an efficient way of getting in there, but it blocks access. So you're kind of thinking, hey, you know, okay, good idea. Bad application, good idea. Um, the other thing you got to really be concerned about um, here in, in Southern California, you guys got the same problem up there, but black whittles, uh, brown whittles, all sorts of other things tend to get up in these darker areas. Me sticking my legs underneath this thing with um, um, not having much sensation in my legs mm, 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 um, tends to be problematic. So keeping the areas clean keeping an eye open for spiders or anything else that may be uh, 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 difficult in the garden. It's something to pay attention to. So having designated areas for, for uh, stored equipment uh, away from uh, the accessibility issues is really important and uh, keeping it clean from dangerous insects and snakes and so on is also really important. So all that needs to be taken into consideration. So we, you spoke earlier, Debbie, about hydroponics. I feel that they're a great way for accessibility. Got to, um, uh, I haven't done uh, hydroponics. I want to, at some point I'm gonna get into it, but uh, it's a great way like Espelay to get up close to the, whatever you're working on. Um, 
and so it's uh, I, I just think it's, it's one of many great things to consider in your garden. The upstart, uh, the cost it may be prohibitive for some people, but it's, um, it's at least worth looking into. Now, start small. If you're new to gardening, uh, I highly recommend that you do something that's right next to your kitchen where you can get kitchen herbs. And I just love uh, kitchen gardens. I love cooking with fresh herbs, particularly tarragon and basils and mints. It, it's just, uh, to me, I, I just love going out and getting that and throwing it into a dish. Um, so it should be close to the kitchen. I have, my two acres is on a narrow property. And um, which means that um, my garden, when I initially set it up, was about, I would say, a good 40 to 50 yards away from the kitchen which was problematic and I learned quite quickly, I didn't wanna go out there as much as I should to get what I needed, it was just too far to go. Um, so I brought things in closer and um, used uh, that area for um, my uh, restoration on the Airstream, which is a, a lot more efficient for me. But the, um, so start small, add on slowly um, and, um, be aware of the budgets. Things are very expensive now, uh, materials. So you you got to keep all that in mind. And this is just a fun idea. I had to throw this in because I just think this is really neat. Not very accessible. And I wouldn't want to put a blind guy in here. Um, that would just be mean. But you um, uh, definitely, kids love stuff like this, and uh, if you have somebody to maintain it, it's great. I, I just think it's it's a fun idea, but uh, if you look closely, you see that these guys up here are tied up, so for somebody like me to harvest this, it, it would be impossible, um, but um, I just think it, it's gorgeous. Um, garden accessories. I built uh, something like this for um, friends of mine. And um, it uh, comes in really handy, particularly if you want to um, lay a garden tool on here or to sit down. Lots of times I get called away and I um, need to put my garden tool somewhere. And by putting it on something like this, it um, helps me find it when I get back. Because um, it's... Um, I'm sure you guys have all run into this where you lay a garden tool down and you come back later and go, God, what was I doing? What was there? And by having something in the open like this comes in really handy to uh, then it's in your vision. The other thing that really helps is to, when you lay something down, take a mental picture of it. And then when you come back, you'll have an uh, idea of what you're looking for. Okay, so another, you know, some more practical ideas. Um, you saw I have some of these birdie beds in my my garden. There's alternatives to that, and uh, livestock watering bins is what's sold in a number of places, and a number of companies are catching on. That um, when I checked into these things last time, the cost of a bed similar to this has gone up dramatically. But uh, initially, when I bought mine, there were Oh, right around $100. Now I think they're around $140, $150. But don't quote me, prices are going up like crazy. But um, if you do get a livestock uh, watering bin and turn it into a raised bed, make sure it has a drain on it. Um, and and do, not do not drill holes into the galvanized steel because galvanized is on top of metal and our steel and the steel will rust and it, it won't last that long. Um, but what I did with these on mine, they were sitting a little lower. And so I put a hose bib on there and then put a clear hose on it. And it didn't last that long. So I have to change them out because it, they, uh, it got full of crud. But basically by having a clear hose on there, you're able to, um, then see how much water is in the bed uh, through that clean hose, clear hose, plastic hose. And then I would drop the hose down, take out the water and put it, use it somewhere else. 
uh, that came in very handy. So um, take advantage of the drain plug and reuse your water. Um, okay, so now these things, it's kind of an industrial look, but if you're doing small crops, um, short crops, strawberries, stuff like that, these things work great. What you got to remember on stuff like this is that air gets all the way around it uh, and they dry out quickly, they take more water. So you got to you know, pay attention to that. Um, I'm assuming water costs in your area is as high as it is here. Um, so that is a resource that we have to nurture and pay attention to. Um, so people always ask me what not to plant and raise beds. I, I don't like planting corn and raised beds because I don't like the idea of getting a ladder out to pick corn um, or to harvest your corn. So keep in mind what you're planting here and what the end result is gonna be. Uh, if you have to get up on a step stool or a ladder to pick your garden vegetables, uh, you know, that's just a non-starter to me. Gotta pay attention. So uh, adapted raised beds. I don't like the word adapted, uh, but um, because everything's adapted for something, a wrench is adapted to a certain type of nut that you're trying or bolt that you're trying to manipulate. So, um, but it's what the common use is and adaptive in case, so it's adapted. But the, here, there, there are several things to keep in mind. Um, when I use these, and I have something similar to this in, in my garden, and I, um, um, when I'm under this, I learn fairly quickly, don't water and be under this thing, because then you're going to be explaining to friends or family that you really don't have a bladder issue, you have a watering issue here with this garden bed. And uh, you, you kind of have to pay attention to uh, you know, do you really want to get soaking wet? And, um, and, uh, uh, and so, you know, you got to set to the side when you're watering. The other thing I notice in my bed that has a similar um, uh, angle here is that things that are planted next to this edge don't do as well as things that are planted in the center that have more depth. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is I'd like the idea of having a, a accessible beds for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but when somebody is assigned to this, they're excluded from the rest of the group. Now, um, I would strongly suggest that part of my inclusiveness in the garden is that everybody works together and everybody uh, works in a partnership with somebody else. So that the kid uh, who happens to be uh, um, a mobility issue for that, for who knows what reason, it could be simply that the kid broke his leg or broke an arm or whatever. And, you know, during the, the healing process, they need a little extra help. Or, you know, you may have a kid who uh, oh, is born with a disability, God forbid, but, you know, it, it happens quite often. And um, so they need to be inclusive. I've taken the approach over the years that you can learn from anybody at any time. And um, a person, uh, just because they're uh, in a chair or you know, have some mobility issues, uh, you know, can't be that, uh, that vessel that you can learn from. Um, and at the very least, you can learn your level of compassion for your fellow human being which is no small feat for some people. Um, so keep in mind that everybody works together and that everybody uh, has a partner in the garden. And it, 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 it really helps out uh, all the way around and everybody can learn. Symbols and signage and so on. Here, um, I, I brought this picture up because I'm kind of a, a a sucker for cave art. I just love this stuff. And we call these guys um, cavemen primitive and so on. But you know, this, uh, this artwork uh, really shows insight that they use these for um, education, for religious purposes, for knowing when to go hunting, all sorts of stuff. 
and um, things that we can't even probably understand because this is out our, outside of our, our realm. But um, signage is really important, but when you have signage like this, um, you got too much and they become a blur and people don't seem to uh, then catch on. So limit your signage to what is important, what is necessary, what is um, uh, uh, direct. And the sign is the appropriate signage for the distance of what it's seen. You can go online and find out what that is. But if somebody's looking at a sign that's three by three inches by three inches and it's 60 feet away, well, there's what's the purpose? It just won't work. Um, so um, if a signage is um, um, large enough for the distance, which is being viewed is, is what I'm trying to say is important. And you can get those numbers online. But the other thing is lots of uh, school gardens that I've worked with here in the San Diego area um, put up signage thanking local groups that um, will give you um, merchandise or help you support the school or community garden. And that's important to do, but don't make it so so cluttered that it becomes a basically visual, uh, becomes invisible because there's too much to take in. Um, but just so you guys know, here in San Diego, and I'm sure it's up at your place, um, uh, Home Depot and Lowe's and, and so on, all have budgets for giving uh, a, a, away products at discounted price or free to community and school gardens. But um, so develop a relationship with um, your local big box stores and the irrigation store, site one that used to be Hydroscape, also was working uh, with school and community gardens giving discount or at cost prices. So develop a relationship with those guys if you're working with a community or school garden. Um, and uh, it will, um, I think, um, should be um, uh, beneficial. And then give them some signage and thanking them for that. Uh, the, um, for the home gardener, uh, I, I spent a lot of times looking at, and asking for discounts just because, you know, what can they say? No, not today. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. This thought I'd ask. So um, pay attention to that. And uh, uh, I hope you get some deals. Now, signage for planting. How many times, I can't even count how many times this has happened to me where I'm planting something in my garden and somebody calls me away, I come back and I say, uh oh, was this, what, what was I planning here? So for kids to have a, a project, grandkids, school kids, whatever, or even adults, put out some signage, you know, uh, before you start planting, this is my eggplant, bell peppers, watermelon in this case. And, um, make yourselves and they're great memory clues and when you get pulled away you come back and you got uh, you, you 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 know what you're doing and um actually it, it makes you look really smart when in fact it's just a necessary way of going about doing things and people go oh isn't that clever well it ain't clever it's necessary so um Adapted tools, again, the whole adapted thing I, you know, I, I got issues with. Um, but anyway, um, right tool for the job. And you can see here that these things, I just went through um, uh, surgery on copal tunnel and cubic nerve uh, uh, on my elbows. And it took me quite a while. Uh, and it's resolved a number of issues and kind of developed a couple more. But nevertheless, um, these tools have helped me out quite a bit in, in my garden when corporal tunnel was really bothering me, but I've gotten those things fixed. But keep in mind that these things are efficient. They're a good way of going about it. And if you just go to uh, the, the web uh, and type in adapted tools, you'll see these things. Amazon has a full uh, line of these and so does other people, but um, Look at this. If it fits your needs, don't be afraid to use it. This says $2.99. I would um, 
And this was done in 2010. So I would bet you that's $5 or $7 now. But um, pay attention to price. Sometimes this stuff goes on sale. And uh, so if you need it, don't, uh, you know, don't, you know, go, go for it and check it out. Maybe not buy all of them, but buy what you need and test it out and see um, how it will work for you. Um, Okay, so I have some of these. These are cordless electric pruning shears. Um, can be really dangerous once you use them. I am um, uh, really big on safety. I only want to be an industrial accident once. And, um, but um, I thought I was buying one of these cordless electric pruners that um, um, if you're, skin is touching this blade or this blade here, it won't work. But when I got it home, I realized that it wasn't one of those. And so when I use this tool, um, it can be really scary. Um, so keep your fingers away, please. But it works really well um, if you have weaker hands and you need to cut, um, trim up a tree or whatever. So it's something to keep in mind. They're not cheap, but they're very, uh, uh, I think, uh, work very well in the garden, but keep safety in mind. Now, this guy here, this is just some of the tools I use in my demonstrations. Um, reachers, I have one in almost every room of the house, and it comes in really handy inside. It comes in really handy in the garden for picking fruit or picking stuff up out of the ground, off the ground. And one of the things I've noticed, anything that um, increases my reach um, also uh, improves my mobility. So I don't have to you know, move, readjust, and carry tools. I can you know, work in, in greater distance and get things done. That's why I like long handle rakes in which I can uh, work uh, raking up things and um, uh, a larger area and then move on now work on another area. This tool here is a reaching pruner. Now I should have um, taken a picture of a, my newer one, but here and here it has these little jaws. So these come in really handy when you're pruning roses or anything with thorns on it because you can clip off the rose, for example, and, um, and then you can take it and it will clamp onto the piece that you've cut off and then drop it right into the garbage can or into the, whatever you're, you're doing. And you keep your arms out of all the start sharp thorns uh, of the roses. One of my master gardener um, uh, buddies uh, lost an eye I don't know exactly how this happened, but he was trimming roses and he got stuck in the eye and uh, developed an infection and he lost use of, of one eye because of that. But by having a reacher uh, pruning device here, it would have kept him out of the way of danger and it worked out really nice. It would work out really nice for, for, for a lot of people. Now this tool and this tool all have uh, foam gripping on it that helps quite a bit. And uh, uh, if you have, uh, well, let's put it this way. My hands are permanently tired from pushing my chair around. And uh, when I use pruners, I uh, tend or other tools, my hands just can't hold the grip anymore. So by having these tools, with this grip on it, along with gloves that have a grip on it, like these guys here, I use far less strength in my hands. And then this little easy gripping tool, which you can find on Amazon, will wrap around the back of your hand and then slide back on here. And it comes in really handy if your hands are tired a week or so on. So that uh, is something to keep in mind. Um, also, I have multiple size pruners. And um, I found that the smaller ones work better in my hands than the larger tools. 
it's good if you're able to have um, to take the time and can buy several tools and just see how they fit in your hand. Uh, I was always dropping one particular pruner. And finally, I said, why am I always dropping this thing? And what I realized when I took the time to really look, when these opened up, it was wider than the palm of my hand and the tip of my fingers. So I would open it up and it would fall out of my hand. So pay attention to how it fits in your hand. It will save you a lot of time uh, in the garden um, when you're going to um, picking, uh, doing some pruning of fruit trees or whatever you happen to be working on. Now, um, this lady here sitting on this little uh, garden uh, seat, this is fine. It wouldn't work for me because I don't have the trunk balance. And anybody who has uh, some core uh, trunk issues, um, uh, I wouldn't suggest using this. You would probably spend more time picking yourself off the walkway than it would be beneficial. So um, you got to pay attention to that. And, uh, it, uh, 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 and um, but they come in, they work for some people and so on. Uh, this one here, again, um, uh, it works for this lady, but if she was watering it right now, then that may be a problem. Uh, uh, for what I stated earlier, but they come in handy. They work, they dry, as I said earlier, they dry out and uh, it's something to pay attention to. Now, um, again, uh, one of my favorite tools, my wife's favorite, oops, well, here we go. Uh, one of my favorite and my wife's is this um, potted plant dolly. You buy these on, uh, you can get them in a number of places. I bought mine on Amazon. It's a little different configuration. They're in the 60 70 dollar range but who knows what that really is now but this comes in really handy for moving things around the yard um and also i have uh small protein propane bottles i used on barbecue and, and other places and it comes in really handy for moving those things around instead of me putting it on the lap so um it's something to uh consider in the garden. Um, the other thing to consider is this garden cart uh, um, uh, kneeler, this one's called, that's the cart up there, but the garden kneeler. Um, my wife loves this because most people I see who are, uh, you know, 60s and 70s, they'll say, I don't have a problem getting down, I have a problem getting up. And so by having something like this, it, it really is handy. Now, the advantage of these things are you use it that way as a kneeler, you flip it around and you sit on it. So it, it has a dual purpose. And um, so uh, if that's something that will work for you, don't be afraid to get it. I don't know the price of these now, they vary and, and so on. This guy up here, um, uh, the garden rolling cart, um, uh, is also handy, but I couldn't use it. Uh, but people and people who had some trunk, uh, weak trunk muscles would also have difficulty using it. But it comes in really handy for a lot of different things. So if you need it, use it. You can see here how this woman is putting stress on her back. And then over in here, it's, um, oh man, uh, it, um, it's, um, it's something to keep in mind with um, what's going on there. Um, of course, somebody's calling me. Um, we'll just put that off to the side. Um, so keep in mind your posture and how you go about working in the garden. Uh, safety strategies is um, really important. And obviously using an electric mower in the rain in, isn't the smartest idea. Lucky for us here in Southern California, we don't get that much rain uh, of late. And um, so it's um, not that much of an issue, but um, keep in mind that uh, safety first. Gloves, I spoke briefly about that. Um, appropriate gloves, I found the ones that have the rubber padding tends to be uh, beneficial and they help with grip, as I mentioned. And if you're dealing with anything sharp uh, or roses or 
or um, berries, raspberries, all that sort of stuff. It's something to pay attention to. Lots of times I use gloves that come further up in the arms and that's a little more beneficial, particularly when I'm dealing with my cactus garden. Um, I was using welding gloves, dealing with some of those guys. And there's one particular plant um, that um, the thorns were so fine that it went through leather welding gloves and it would uh, bother your hands. So, and those strategies, you're working with that sort of stuff, uh, wrap the plant in old carpet or cardboard, then um, use a good heavy gloves and it, it will help out quite a bit. Aprons, I use leather to protect my lower limbs, primarily because with the lack of feeling uh, in that, and lots of times uh, as you get older, uh, you tend to not have the uh, nerve sensation that you had when you're younger. So protecting yourself with a, a good, strong apron is, is really important. Now, I'm a firm believer in avoiding these tools. Um, I've used them uh, out of my chair, uh, and um, when this guy, when I would hit a rock using a digging bar, the vibrations would come up the bar, go into my elbows and shoulders. And then about two o'clock in the morning, laying in bed, it let me know I did something wrong. I firmly believe that the main purpose of these two tools is to teach young men the value of a higher education. Uh, you've spent a day using these things, you best um, find a better way of earning an income. Also, I firmly believe that if you have to use this stuff to um, prepare your garden, get a raised bed, pump it down, fill it with good soil, and um, go to work doing what you want to do. This sort of stuff is, is, is not uh, my idea of fun. Uh, another idea, these carts here, I can't remember now, I looked them up the other day, um, but you can find these on a number of different sites, and I think they were under $100, um, but um, it's really handy to have these uh, uh, available, and you can just, you know, roll it out to the garden, use it, put it away, uh, keep things nice and, and orderly, it's, uh, it, it's, it's really a, a good way to go. If you're storing tools, like I talked earlier about numbering, easy to do, easy to um, hang. Um, and I think it looks pretty nice, but it's important to keep things organized and keep it uh, easy access uh, for um, easy mobility. And you know where things are. And one of the problems I run into when my shop is messy, I find it easier to go buy the tool than to, um, um, try to find it. And so I may have, you know, many small tools in, in quantities that most people shouldn't have. You know, I got to go down to buy whatever that I'm working on. And I figure, ah, let's just get another whatever. And uh, so now I have um, squares and maybe three or four when I need one. But, you know, um, it's just the, the way it, um, of, of dealing with this stuff. Now, um, here's a little video that pretty much sums up everything I'm talking about. But one of the um, ideas is brought forward that kind of honed everything into me was these steps of, of, uh, that you're gonna see here dealing with uh, uh, access. And this is what architects use and um, lots of designers use. And I've uh, incorporated it in my program to use uh, within the garden. So anyway, here we go. It's a few minutes long, so enjoy. The UCCE Master Gardener and Master Gardener Association of San Diego County brings you designing friendly, inclusive garden spaces with UCCE Master Gardener, Stephen Cantu. FIG stands for Friendly, safe and easy movement around the garden and the right tool for the right job. Inclusive for all levels of ability and age gardens. In section A, we'll look at the seven principles of universal design. These seven principles are one, equitable use, two, flexibility in use, 
three, simple and intuitive use, four, perceptible information, five, tolerance for error, six, low physical effort, and seven, size and space for approach and use. Number one, equitable use. When designing your space, think of yourself and everyone that will be using your garden. Think of their age, think of their size, think of physical abilities. Will you or your intended users be bringing in pets? Can your space accommodate a wheelchair? Or planning ahead for a pregnancy during your gardening years? Number two, flexibility in use. There are many ways to achieve flexibility in the garden. Keep your tools in good shape and in easily accessible areas for you and your users. Decide how you and your users will access your beds. Consider appropriate bed heights. And for more vertical flexibility, you could use vertical gardening, container gardening, or espalier. There are pulley systems and raised beds on wheels to add lots of flexibility to any garden. Number three, simple and intuitive use. Make your designs user-friendly. Create wide, unobstructed pathways and workspaces. And always consider the intended flow of your space. Number four, perceptible information. It is important to communicate essential information clearly and precisely. Consider your intended users when making your signage and make it as perceptible as possible. Number five, tolerance for error. Always design with the right materials for the environment and the users. Be sure to consider drainage issues. Standing water, hoses, and tools can all present hazards. It is important to minimize hazards and adverse consequences. Number six, low physical effort. This principle allows for a workspace that will be effective, comfortable, and one that minimizes stress. <laughs> and number seven, size and space for approach and use. Consider your path of travel, your workspace, your entrance, and your exits. Make sure there is ample room to turn around, to work, to enter, and to leave. Section B, tools. In our daily garden practices, there's a multitude of jobs that must be done. And there are tools for every job. Tools come in all shapes and sizes and some with special features making them more adaptable to different needs. Are some helpful design features for all users. Grippers can be used to reach into the middle of beds. Telescopic handles can also help with reaching. Some tools are equipped with arm support cuffs that can help with balance, strength, and leveraging issues. There are ergonomically designed tools and tools with soft grip handles. All of these tools fit in our friendly inclusive gardening designs. Gardens feed our minds, bodies, and souls. Help us cultivate diversity together. Learn more about adaptable and inclusive gardens from the Master Gardener Association of San Diego County. www.mastergardenersc.org Friendly Inclusive Garden Spaces is developed by Stephen Cantu, UCCE Master Gardener. This film was produced by C. Brown, UCCE Master Gardener, and music by bensound.com. This film is a Black Swan Ranch production. Okay, guys. Um... I guess we got a couple minutes if there's any questions. Um, I'll be more than happy to try to answer. This is just a little view here of one aspect of my garden that I've been slowly working on. And I mean, slowly, been 20 years and I've just done some planting. Uh, but anyway, um, so uh, any questions, I'll be um, try to entertain them.
Yeah, I just wanted to um, thank you, Stephen. That was a great presentation. A lot of things that um, we as gardeners might not even be aware of. So thank you for bringing those to our attention. Um, we've got time for uh, one or two questions before we move on with our agenda, but thank you so much. Thank you. So if anybody wants to type anything in the chat or unmute and um, while people are typing or uh, I'll watch for people to unmute. I just want to say, yeah, Stephen, this was really, I'm sort of even just thinking about uh, the slides that I have, the way I represent gardens um, in my presentations. I'm thinking about how both my grandma and I have spent a lot of time tripping and falling in the garden. Um, so this is a, the things yeah. you brought up are relevant to everyone. And I, I could see where you say, you know, um, you know, that things are adapted, right, for every circumstance. Um, and uh, another thing that we talk a lot about, and I'm sure you know of Tom Spellman uh, with Dave Wilson's Nursery, Mm -hmm. He talks so much about um, tree height as well. I think he and people he've know, he's known have fallen out of a lot of ladders and can really cause a lot of problems. So keeping your fruit trees down to a reasonable pruning height um, is also um, something that you can do for safety and accessibility in the garden. I um, mean, the oh, thing absolutely. about the- Absolutely. Um, and for fruit production also, I mean, it's better for the trees and- I know with my 30 some uh, fruit trees, I give away a lot of fruit. We can, we freeze and, um, um, but uh, yeah, um, how many oranges can you eat for God's sake, you know? Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, keeping that down uh, is, is reasonable. I got to admit around my house with all my fruit trees, I'm not worried at all about scurvy, that's for sure. But um, it's, um, it, it is important to um, um, for a safety aspect and a health aspect to um, keep your fruit at a manageable level. And then I see Autumn, uh, you have your hand up. Um, I don't know if you wanted to unmute and ask a question or share. Um, I just had a question about, say if a garden has um, raised beds made out of wood, but they're not sure if it's treated or where it's from, um, would it be, you know, a safe practice to line the beds or, you know, make sure that the soil isn't touching the wood, you know, if you're not sure where the wood is from or what's been done to it? Um, okay, so you're talking about treated materials um, and um, keeping the, the soil uh, away from the treated materials. Yes. Um, Okay, so keep in mind that brown tree materials is designed to be next to soil. Um, green is, if you can still find it, is supposed to be next to concrete. Black or, or creosote that you see in railroads is meant for designs in very wet uh, water conditions. Um, so let's go back to what we mostly see, and that's the brown tree that materials going next to um, soil. Um, it does help to put a plastic liner in there. They hold up fairly well if they don't, are not exposed to sunlight. When it's exposed to sunlight, the plastic deteriorates and falls apart, and uh, you have then micro um, plastic particles that never go away. Um, I uh, would just prefer to um, forget the, the, the materials and go with the um, metal bands. Uh, I think that's a better way of going about it. Uh, but anyway, okay, so yes, um, it does perform a barrier. Um, but again, if you're touching the um, treated materials and then touching your food, um, I, that to me is a problem. So keep that in mind and that's the biggest problem. Um, and then having the plastic covering up that it won't last long in the sunlight. So what do you do? Well, you can paint it. 
Um, but then that's a, a, another issue. I, I, I think the best approach is uh, staying away from the wood. Um, the cost of the beds now, last I heard it was over $350 to build a, a bed and you can build roughly the same size um, uh, or you can buy the same size bed for a hundred and some dollars, $150. So it doesn't make sense anymore from a financial or physical standpoint to um, um, use the wood materials. I, I, I hope I'm, I'm clear on that and you um, got yeah, some ideas. You. Yeah. I agree. Well, I think um, we'll go ahead and uh, go to our next um, uh, partner we're gonna share with Stephen. Just thank you so much. Um, I, yeah, you're talking about the U-shaped gardens. Um, that was a really, uh, several of the comments you made on that slide from the height of the little cement strip to just being able to get out of that U-shaped garden, really eye-opening for me. Mm -hmm. um, lots of comments in the chat about thanking you and um, people already looking forward to share this with people who weren't able to make it today. Um, so just uh, our heartfelt thanks for joining us today. Well, my um, and we pleasure. Look forward... And again, if anybody has any comments, they can um, drop me a line at com2 at cox.net. And I would appreciate any comments. Thank you. Wonderful. So Debbie or Stephen, if you want to drop the, that into the chat, um, and then uh, feel free to email him with comments and questions. Um, I can tell you are a wealth of knowledge, Stephen. Very Thank good. You. Thank right. you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Have a great day. And we can, if you want to stay on with us Thank for the you. rest of the day or attend future workshops, we welcome you to. So, okay, I'm going to go ahead and go over to, we have one of our partners with us today um, and uh, they're going to share, oh, I reformatted the slide. Look, and the writing is in white here. So I'm going to, here we go. Um, so Danielle, if you're on, let's see, um, I'm sharing now, I can't see the participants, but I think you're on. Danielle, do you want to share a little bit? Yes, thank you so much, Maggie. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Danielle Martinez, and I am with San Bernardino, San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools um, Healthy SBCSS Nutrition Program. And I am happy to be here to share a little bit about the work we're doing around gardening. Um, our program supports the 33 school districts in our county with um, nutrition and physical activity resources. Um, and we also support these school districts um, with gardening, technical assistance, and um, resources. Um, we have a few um, sites that I are um, that we were working with this school year, and I um, included some pictures of some of the things that they were growing. Um, we worked with a um, preschool, uh, early childhood childhood center for um, Hesperia. That was our Lemon Street preschool, and they actually had a um, old sandbox that was emptied and abandoned, and they wanted to turn that into a gardening plot. And so we helped them to. Um, get that started and the students really um, had a wonderful time using that this past school year um, getting to use that in taste tests in the classroom and things like that um, we also partnered with fontana unified's um, shadow hills elementary school and they had a really big successful garden they have um, gardening pods that are for every um, grade and so um, the, the grades really take ownership of these pods and kind of get to decide um, what they wanna grow. And um, it was a really successful year. They used that for, um, for learning. They incorporated that into their weekly, um, their learning environment. And so they were out there doing science and art and reading and just really um, had a really great experience with that. Um, we partner with, um, our early childhood centers, like I said, and our schools. So if you um, have an interest or you have um, a partner, we'd love to be able to collaborate and um, support you with either gardening curriculum or gardening materials to um, revitalize um, school gardens. And my information is up there. If you are um, with the school today, if you wouldn't mind maybe sharing your, um, your contact information and your school site, um, we can follow up and, um, you know, answer any questions. Thank you so much, Maggie. Great, thank you so much for joining us. And this is one of the things we really 
want to start doing is connecting all of the people who are working on school and community gardens. So yeah, uh, reach out to Danielle and Danielle will also be reaching out to you and Farah and seeing how we can uh, work together um, to help get, well, I think there's over 500 schools in San Bernardino County, right? So uh, it's going to take a whole team of us to get to all of them. And I'm looking forward to getting a garden in every school. That would be so amazing. So uh, I'm going to, let's see, get the right presentation here. So we'll be hearing from IERCD in a few minutes. I just want to share really quickly about our seed library in every community project. Let's see, get my slideshow going. And um, okay, so um, okay, so uh, we're gonna cut. We're gonna uh, piece this recording together. We're gonna have the whole recording as one, and then we're also gonna break these out. So if you want to hear just from Stephen or just different parts of Debbie's great presentation on soil today, um, or hear this, it will be separate. So I'm gonna officially start it here. So welcome to our seed library and every community project. This is something that master gardeners have uh, worked on for several years. Uh, we started our seed library in about 2017. So we're five years in, where does the time go? My son here is pictured when he was just a wee one and he is uh, you know, taller than me at this point. But this is something we started at Chino Basin Water Conservation District and started um, because we wanted to bring seed savers together from all over the county. And we offered free seed saving classes and we had seeds that we donated to the public. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about the seed library itself in just a moment. Uh, but a seed library is a great place to create community. Um, and it's not just about the seeds you're having um, or sharing, collecting. It's also just about the community that comes together to learn more about this. It can help educate the public and your community. And I certainly have educated myself about the whole plant life cycle. It seems kind of silly. Um, here, I'm going to open the chat because I don't know if you guys can see that little bar up at the top and it's not going away. Okay, I hope you guys can't see that. Um, but so the whole plant life cycle, you know, often if we buy a plant from the store, we'll sort of step in here when the plant is four or six inches tall. And then we'll grow it and we'll get our beans, we'll get our tomatoes, we'll get our squash, um, we'll get our flowers, whatever it is. And then the plant dies back if it's an annual plant. And um, we'll come back in here again and we'll next year or next season, we'll buy a four to six inch plant. But there's so much of the plant life cycle that we're not participating in and learning from. And I think, you know, seed saving is something when you look at creating community around seed saving, seed saving is something that's been done for thousands of years, um, you know, tens of thousands of years as humans. And it's knowledge that's really getting getting lost and very quickly, you know, if you look at skills, sewing, cooking, um, some basic, um, you know, maintenance work or construction, being able to sort of fix things yourself and repair things rather than throwing them away, being able to plant a seed, grow it, harvest it, save the seed, and grow it again. These are skills that we've um, had for generations and generations that are very quickly getting lost. I'm in my 40s and my grandma knew all about this, but a lot of kids who are in elementary school now, their grandparents, maybe you know my age or in their 50s, and they may not have that knowledge. So is this really something important to um, keep the uh, knowledge going. And so we like to think while our seed library is focused around the giving and sharing of seeds, it's a lot more than that. It's about education. I'm not um, any particularly uh, organized religion, but I'm a very spiritual person. And it amazes me to see like a, a little pea or bean seed, which is hard as a rock. If you plant it and give it what it needs, it grows and can feed us and create beauty and can create habitat. And so seeds are also something that where you can really see the miracle of life, however you interpret it, whatever that means to you, seeds are definitely a place to see that. So um, seed saving and just understanding the process are so important, is so important. You can learn about the movements of seeds when you're thinking about planting and harvesting. And it can is another way to connect us to nature as master gardeners. And as you've heard, you know, Debbie talking and Stephen talking, um, and if you've heard our presentations or talked to us before, um, we're always um, really encouraging people just getting out. You know, it's great to eat health, freshy, health, fresh, healthy produce, 
um, and have nourish your body that way. But gardens, that's just a little part of the way gardens nourish you. They nourish our emotional health. They nourish our mental health. They get us away from our devices, which we'll let you guys do in a few minutes. And it's a great day to go out and soil build um, and get thinking about your fall plantings. As Debbie said, it's uh, just around the corner. Um, and so we want to... Um, you know, share that with the community and help you guys bring that into your lives. That's why we do things like today's workshop to make sure that gardening is inclusive. And seed saving just takes it to another level and really gets you thinking about, you know, this is at the Huntington Gardens and they have a really cool display if seeds are um, dispersed by wind. Do they, are they dispersed by water? Are they dispersed by, you know, catching on to a coyote's leg or your sock? So it's just another great way to get people thinking. And then having a seed library gives you access to locally grown seeds, or even if you don't grow them yourself, just a general supply of seeds for your community, giving you a little bit of independence. Think back to the beginning of COVID. There wasn't a supply shortage of seeds in the nation, but there was a shortage of um, this in the supply chain. So in the beginning of COVID, if you were wanting to garden, you went into the nurseries and there weren't a lot of seeds available. And my dream and our vision as master gardeners is that people have seeds available to them in every community, whether they're donated to you and they're commercially prepared seeds or they are um, seeds that you've grown yourself. What's involved in starting a seed library? It's pretty straightforward, pretty easy. Just a willingness to learn about seeds and a willingness to make mistakes. That's like master gardeners. We always say, I think we have a lot of experience because we've killed a lot of plants and we know what not to do. I mean, you need someone who's willing to watch over the little library. You want to decide what types of seeds to save, whether you're going to be fruits and veggies, flowers, native plants, super easy to save, pretty challenging to start. So if you like a challenge, um, get yourself some native seeds, but things like poppies or buckwheat, there's a few other things that are easier to start. Fruit trees for a few different reasons. Uh, usually we don't see, save from those. They're started on a disease resistant rootstock um, and also they're cross pollinated a lot. So those are things we usually don't save. Um, and other ornamentals you can save to create habitat. Alyssum is a little flower that surfid flies love and they're a really great beneficial predator. And especially for the citrus screening disease, you want to bring a surfid flies in because they'll eat the Asian citrus psyllid that spreads that disease. So those are some easy things to start. You need a secure place to store your seed free of pests, extreme temperatures, and creatures two-legged or four-legged that might walk off with your seeds. The seed library takes just a few hours a month of tidying the library, doing a little bit of planning and thinking ahead. So if you're wondering if you have time for a seed library, it really just takes a few hours per month. What do you need? This was our very first seed library and my little one, uh, yeah, like five or six years ago when we started, just need a storage container, labeling materials. When Stephen was talking earlier about labeling tools, such a great idea, labeling garden beds with numbers, Great idea. You think you're going to remember things. Labeling irrigation. You think you're going to remember things. Same thing with seeds. So you definitely want to have a solid labeling system with information like the date it's harvested, a little bit of information about the plant, and any other um, information that might be relevant. You want a journal, perhaps, for the seed library. If you want to get a little bit more involved in growing your own seeds, a seed storage container or packets like you see here. We have little coin envelopes a cool dry place, and again, someone to look over them. And of course you need seeds and the seeds can be donated. There's a number of organizations that will donate seeds. They can also be locally grown or maybe your seed library has a little bit of both. So how can we help? We can visit your site to determine the best type of storage to use. Um, maybe it's a cute little free seed library. Maybe your community has issues with theft or vandalism. So it's a Tupperware that you bring in or somebody brings home and they bring back to the community garden, something that's stored in the uh, classroom under a little cupboard or something. Um, we can help provide you with those storage boxes and set up. These are master gardeners again, how we can help you. And then we can help you design the community interaction within your library. Um, will you be checking those seeds out? Are you asking people to try to save some? Are you a school where you're having fifth graders grow seeds for incoming fifth graders future years? Are you going to be asking for donations? We have a good list of places that will donate seeds at the end of the season. 
um, will help train your um, seed library shepherd and make sure they know the basics of what they need to do. We'll um, help you figure out who will keep the library organized and what is need to be done, needed to be done. And then we'll also help you figure out um, do you how do you want to include outside community members, you know, whether they're parents, your students, whether it's at a community garden or even at home and you might want to share seeds. We also provide starter seeds that have been donated to us. We offer free classes each month for the community and we'll be here to provide technical resources, uh, technical assistance and provide um, resources for any questions that you might have or answers for questions. So know that if um, you're interested in getting a seed library started um, at home, we have a presentation that I did just on Thursday about starting a seed library at home. That's posted on our YouTube channel. Um, or if you're a school or community garden, a public organization, and you would like us to help you get a seed library started, you can send an email to our Master Gardener helpline and I'm going to let them know to be looking for those requests and we'll start going um, in order of first come first serve and just work through the process. It's very easy, requires a really minimal amount of supplies, and it's a great way to um, bring all kinds of elements, whether again you're in a school, you're measuring growth, you're measuring different sides of seed, sizes of seeds, or you're in a community garden where you want to maybe everybody's going to work together to grow cilantro one season. So we're here to help on that. Um, and I'm going to move over to um, IERCD next. Um, if you guys have any questions about the seed library, I'm not monitoring the chat, um, but we are here to help. So I hope that I just gave you a real quick um, introduction to what our seed library in every community project is. Uh, Huerta del Valle Garden has a vision. It's in Ontario was started there. It had a vision for a community garden every mile. And from that, I'm like, we need a seed library in every community. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to IERCD. Autumn is on. Autumn, are you here? And I'll stop sharing and you can share your screen. I'm here. All right, let me. Okay, I'm going to, you should be able to share your screen. And um, again, thank you guys for joining us. And we just have a few more things to share. We're going to hear from our great partner, IERCD, the Inland Empire Resource Conservation District. Um, they're a wonderful organization that we love partnering with. So I'm looking forward to hearing from them. So thank you, Autumn, um, for sharing with us today. Of course, yeah. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Autumn. I'm the Sustainable Agriculture Program Technician for IERCD. And I'm a part of our sustainable agriculture team. Um, so I just wanted to talk today a little bit about what we do, some of IERCD's other programs that relate to school gardens and agriculture. Um, so yeah. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the IERCD, um, we're a local government agency serving um, this area here outlined in black on the map. Um, so it encompasses, you know, San Regino County, um, a little bit of Riverside. Um, so that's over 2 million residents in the area. Um, we're governed by a board of directors. Um, and our main focus is conservation. So we have different departments. So mine is sustainable agriculture. We also have um, restoration, forestry, education, and outreach. Um, so our habitat restoration team works to um, install plants and recover areas that have been neglected. Our forestry team helps survey trees that have been impacted by fires and pests and diseases. Our education team goes to schools and community um, organizations to present about these different programs for um, kids K through 12, um, and occasionally sometimes um, to colleges and universities. Um, and sustainable agriculture team, we help farms and community gardens with technical support, workshops, um, and things like that. So with community garden support, um, we work with local gardens um, and help them with technical support, volunteering, event coordination. This is a picture of Huerta del Valle in Ontario, which is a great 
community garden and urban farm. Um, and we do a lot with them and other gardens at schools and churches and other organizations. Um, we also provide technical assistance for these farms and gardens in the form of um, helping with grants, soil testing, um, and we partner with the NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, um, to help gardens who need financial resources or equipment. Um, there's a lot of resources available through the NRCS, and so we kind of help bridge that gap for farmers who aren't too familiar with you know, the application process, maybe they need help with translation if they don't speak English as their first language. So we help them with that. Um, so soil testing, Lucy is um, the main one who does the soil testing for farms and gardens and it tests for um, all the nutrients in the soil um, so that we can see you know how your soil is doing if you're having trouble growing things soil could be the reason why so um, if you're interested in that you can request a soil test um, we'll take the sample send it to a lab and get the results and then we'll explain those results to you what does it mean and what you should do based on your results Um, and so we work a lot with the master gardeners. Um, I love our workshops. They're so much fun. Um, and we talk about, you know, gardening best practices, um, tree pruning. Sometimes we do stuff with the master food preservers because that's a great way to, you know, talk about, okay, now you grew stuff. Now what do you do with all the stuff that you grew? Um, how can you use it? How can you save it? Um, and with our education department, we work a lot with kids um, to teach them about conservation and the value of conserving natural resources. We also just help um, local gardens um, by providing plants, um, support with building garden beds, if we have the resources available. Um, we have our native plant nursery where we grow different native plants like sage, milkweed, and a lot of times we have these available if your garden is interested in having these. And so this is our team. You can take a screenshot or a picture if you're ever interested in contacting us. Um, there's Lucy, me, Nancy, and Susie. So that's the sustainable agriculture team of the IERCD. And you can follow us on our website. So it's iercd.org. And we also have Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, which you can find on the website. Um, and the website has a lot of great information about our sustainable agriculture program and all of our other programs as well. And I think that's it. Well, thank you so much, Autumn, for sharing. We really enjoy our partnership as well. Um, a resource conservation district and cooperative extension with all of its programs, Master Gardener, Master Food Preserver, our nutrition program. They all work so well together to get um, information out to the public, sort of leveraging all of our skill sets and resources together. So just a few more things and we'll let you guys go for the day. We really appreciate you guys joining us. Um, I just wanted to really briefly talk in addition to our seed library in every community um, for community gardens and school garden um, uh, project that we're working on. Remember, if you're a home gardener we and for school and community gardens, we have monthly seed saving talks so we can walk you through that process, even if you're joining as not part of a school or community garden today. Um, and so our, we also have a hydroponics in every classroom. Um, that's a little bit ambitious. We only have three units so far. Um, but what we would like to do is work with schools to get hydroponic units into the classroom, especially in areas where they may not be able to have a garden outside. Now, if you have a garden outside, it doesn't mean you don't qualify. Um, definitely reach out to our Master Gardener Helpline if you're interested in having a hydroponic unit. It looks similar to this one. 
in your classroom. And basically we'll kind of help you get, we'll provide you with this unit to use for a semester or two. We'll help you get started. There's so much great curricula out there for doing hydroponics activities in the classroom, but sometimes there can be too much great information. So between Debbie and myself through the environmental education program, we'll help you sort of cultivate classroom appropriate material. And then after a semester or two, if it's something you would like to look to getting for more of your classrooms, uh, there's a lot of grants available and we can help you. We can't submit the grant for you, but we can help you sort of guide you through the grant writing process. And one of the things we can um, express in the grant is that the Master Gardeners will be there to help you. And I've worked with um, several schools who have gotten hydroponic units that way. One school up in the high desert got one for all of their, I think it was third grade teachers. And they had a unit that they all did at the same time. They rolled them in for half the year. And it was amazing that the knowledge that the kids got from that. So if you're interested in getting a hydroponic unit in the classroom, please email our Master Gardener helpline. And we have a couple units that are ready to roll out right now. Never forget that we are like Batman waiting by the phone for all of your plant questions. It doesn't matter if you're a Master Gardener, doesn't matter if you are a community gardener, a school gardener, a home gardener, an apartment gardener, an indoor gardener. If you have questions about something you're growing plant-wise, if you have questions about pests, if you have questions about diseases, we have a phone number and an email that you can call us anytime and we'll get back to you. We also have online time where you can join us the second Sunday of each month and ask questions, show us your garden, take pictures. Uh, we can Google or do like a, a, a map search of your property. We've helped people design their gardens during that time, give them suggestions. Um, so the second Sunday of each month, it's on our website. You can find us and ask us questions. You can call us every day. We love a challenge. Don't be shy. Um, I'm going to take you real quick and then I'll let you guys go over to our website um, and just show you a few of the things that we've talked about. One of the things that we have is a tab for school and youth gardens. Oh, mm -hmm. oh there it is. <laughs> um, and that one will take you to all sorts of resources for school and youth gardens that we've cultivated. Um, we also have the recent presentation tab. And from there, you have some of the links to our gardening channels, but I love this resource sheet section. And if you take, for example, seed saving, you can click on it and we've cultivated all of the resources that we've accumulated for seed saving for that particular talk. So these are a really great resource to the community. Let me make sure I'm sharing the right screen. Sometimes you never know. Um, you can also click on the upper right hand side and click to the gardening videos. That will take you to our website, I mean, I'm sorry, our YouTube channel. And that YouTube channel is for our master gardeners, our master food preservers, our nutrition program, and 4-H. So it says UCCE San Bernardino. So that is our master gardener plus our other program um, channel. And we'll be putting today's recordings on that channel. Debbie, I don't know if you wanna drop the link to that chat, but if you, or link to that um, YouTube channel, but also if you just go to our website and you click on gardening videos, or you click down here on recent presentations, it will take you to the link to our videos. You guys can also sign up for our newsletter. Um, and there's also like a video on the gardening channel about how to use the integrated pest management website, really just walking you through the steps to doing some of your own plant diagnosis. And with that, um, you know, I think that's it for me today. Oh, I do wanna share, and um, I know a couple of people have had to go, um, but one of the, a couple of the organizations that we work with um, have some really great things going on. So one of the people that really inspired this collaborative um, was Robin Ronkis and her team at the County Nutrition Action Partnership Group. It's largely focused um, toward nutrition things and school related things, but so many partners from 211 San Bernardino to Safe Routes to School to Oral Health to people like the Master Gardeners and other cool organizations doing um, unique things in the community. They all come to these meetings. They meet every few months. Um, they're really just so valuable. And um, so Robin, if you are here and can drop that link um, in the chat to ways that people could sign up to find out about the next upcoming meeting. I think it's in November. I don't know, Robin, if you're on, is that right? Is the next meeting, am I remembering correctly, in November? 
Yes, it's tentatively November 9th, and we're actually going to be focusing on SB 1383. And I'm hoping uh, I can get some of your support um, to present um, at that meeting in regards to maybe, you know, composting and what to do with organic materials and um, maybe even food recovery through uh, use uh, the food preserver, master food preservers. So it sounds like hopefully. a it sounds like a wonderful partnership. And again, thank you. Robin is an amazing person along with her team. They do amazing things. I really encourage you to check this out. There may be times when they're talking about the Department of Education and their rules for summer meals. And you're like, does this apply? But so many of the things, plus they have fun exercises during break time. Um, and part of a break off group that is um, formed out of that is the Anti-Hunger Coalition. And I don't know, Robin, if people can contact through you to find out more. They have a newsletter that they send out and they meet periodically. But looking at a way, um, a food rescue anti-hunger coalition to look at how to reduce food waste ties into this SB 1383, reducing hunger, just sort of connecting all of the dots. So a great organization or a great um, committee that has risen out of this county nutrition or scene action partnership or CNAP partnership. Yes, um, definitely. If they um, contact me, then I can uh, forward it to um, our FRAC uh, coordinator, the food rescue okay. and hunger coordinator. So yes. Perfect. Um, and so if you guys are at all interested in um, food rescue and, uh, you know, looking at ways to um, reduce food insecurity, if you're interested in any of that, they're looking for partners of all different organizations and parts of the community um, to bring their skill set together to brainstorm new and unique ideas and to get policies in place. Um, they need all of us. Um, so thank you. Um, so email Robin. I think she put her contact in the chat. And then the last one is as part of the Inland Empire Resource Conservation District, um, uh, who we just heard from, they have a San Bernardino Urban Agriculture Stakeholder Task Force. And we're meeting several times. We're about halfway through. But if you're at all interested in the preservation or the um, creation, um, the future of urban agriculture in San Bernardino County, I encourage you to um, connect with this task force. Autumn, can they email you to get on the mailing list or should they email me? Um, I think we can email you or Nancy. Okay. So um, great. So if you guys did take a screenshot of Autumn's slide and it showed Nancy Noriega, um, you can email her, but you can also just email me. Debbie, maybe you could drop my email address in the chat, um, and I will connect you with um, the um, uh, invite list for this Urban Agriculture Stakeholder Task Force. It's a small group of about 20 to 30 people who are working on the future of agriculture in San Bernardino, and I think if you're part of a school or community garden, you're part of that conversation. So with that, um, I want to end um, by just thanking everybody, our wonderful speakers, our community partners. If anybody has an upcoming event, they'd like to drop in the chat, um, you know, whether it's big or small, as long as you want the public to come, feel free to drop that in the chat. If at our next workshop in January, you'd like to present, um, we'd love to hear from you. You can email me. This is the QR code um, for the presentation, uh, for the workshop in January. Um, and so you could uh, click there to register or Debbie's also going to drop the link in the chat. Um, and I think with that, um, Debbie, unless there's anything you can think of, I just so appreciate you spending your Saturday with us. Um, I, I really learned so much from our speakers and I really enjoy having our partners um, join and hear what they're um, doing. So anything else, Debbie? Nope, I don't have anything else. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Okay, great. And thank, thank you, Susan Debbie. Again for yes. uh, your great presentation. And also, Autumn, for your presentation about IERCD. Very good. And thank you, Debbie, for um, being my fearless co-host. Um, and uh, I look forward to future workshops. I'm going to go ahead and leave this um, screen up, I think, until we sign off, just in case anybody's trying to get that QR code to work. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next time. And so I'm going to stop the recording. And thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, I stopped screen sharing. Well, you know, at least I didn't. And oh, I can't find any of the buttons. There we go. All right.